Okay guys, I have a test Sunday I'm not ready for. So if you want to study with me, I'm going over NCLEX questions on biliary tract disorders. I think this is about your gallbladder, your pancreas, your liver, all that stuff. Ready? Let's go. A client has undergone a laparoscopic cholecystic Gectomy. I still haven't learned how to say that. It means your gallbladder is removed. Which of the following instructions should the nurse include in the discharge teaching? Empty the bile bag daily. If you become nauseated, breathe deeply into a paper bag. Keep adhesive dressing in place for six weeks. Report bile color drainage from any incision. I don't think you get a bag with this. I'm going to say report the bile color drainage. Okay, yeah, four. There should be no bile color drainage coming from any of the incisions postoperatively. A laparoscopic cholecystectomy does not involve a bile bag. Breathing deeply into a paper bag will prevent a person from passing out due to hyperventilation. It does not alleviate nausea. If the adhesive dressings have not already fallen off, they are removed by the surgeon in seven to ten days, not in six weeks. That was a pretty easy one. Except for saying that word is not cholecystectomy. It means your gallbladder is being removed. It does, you don't get a bag. And breathing, you don't get like a gallbladder bag. And breathing into a paper bag is not going to help nausea. Okay. Question two. A 40-year-old client is admitted to the hospital with a diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. The nurse should contact the physician to question which of the following orders. So what is going to be detrimental to cholecystitis? One, IV fluid therapy of normal saline solution be effused at 100 mils an hour until further notice. Seems okay with me. I don't think you're going to be on fluid overload. Two, administer morphine sulfate 10 milligrams IM every four hours as needed for severe abdominal pain. Um, I mean, you would be in a lot of pain. Three, nothing by mouth until further orders. Okay, you're thinking he's going to have surgery, so make him in PO. That makes sense. Four, insert a nasogastric tube and connect to low intermittent suction. I'm not sure why you do the low intermittent suction. If you, if you take out someone's stomach contents, you can throw off some electrolytes and stuff. So I'm going to question the give them an NG tube on suction and the nurse should question the order for morphine sulfate guys i got it wrong because it's believed to cause biliary, biliary spasm so don't give morphine to someone with cholecystitis cholec yeah acute cholecystitis don't give them morphine don't give them morphine preferred analgesic is merperidine or demerol Demerol for cholecystitis. There you go, pharmacology, guys. Elderly clients should not be given Demerol, though, because of the risk of acute confusion and seizures. In the elderly population, uh, IV alternative pain medication will be used. IV fluid therapy is to maintain fluid and electrolyte balance, which could result from being NPO and the gastric suctioning. The NPO and gastric Decompressing, prevent further gallbladder stimulation. Okay, so they're putting the NG tube in suctioning so that you don't have stuff in your stomach, which is going to stimulate your gallbladder. That makes sense. Got it wrong, but that makes sense. Okay, number three. A client is admitted to the hospital with a diagnosis of cholecystitis from cholelithiasis. The client has severe abdominal pain, nausea, and has vomited several times. Based on these data... Which nursing diagnosis would have the highest priority for intervention at this time? So it means what's the most important? Anxiety related to severe abdominal discomfort? Probably not. Deficient fluid volume related to vomiting? Uh, uh, maybe. Three, pain related to gallbladder inflammation? I mean, it is painful. Four, imbalanced nutrition less than body requirements related to vomiting. We're not going to worry about nutrition or anxiety, number one, because those are not the highest priority. Deficient fluid volume, I mean, maybe is a thing, but are they going to need surgery? So you don't, I don't know. 
pain usually isn't, but I mean, that is a very painful thing. And it says severe pain. I'm going to go with pain. Probably wrong. Number three. Ah, yay, guys. The priority for nursing care at this time is to decrease pain. Yeah, severe abdominal pain. It's caused by biliary spasms. Opioid analgesics are given to relieve the severe pain and spasm of cholecystitis. Relief of pain may decrease nausea and vomiting and thereby decrease the client's likelihood of developing further complications. So you decrease the pain... You decrease the nausea and vomiting, you can decrease further complications. And they said there's no data to suggest this client is anxious. Interesting. Four, uh, this is blue, select all that apply. A client's stools are light gray in color. That's a liver problem. The nurse should assess the client further for which of the following. Select all that apply. Okay, choice one, intolerance of fatty foods. That would be maybe a gallbladder problem. Fever, jaundice, respiratory distress, pain at McBurney's point, and peptic ulcer disease. I know jaundice. I'm going to guess pain at McBurney's point. I don't know what that is. We're going to find out. And I'm going to guess intolerance to fatty foods and fever. I'm going to go... One, two, three, and five. One, two, three. Not pain. Let's find out what McBurney's point is. Okay, bile is created in the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and released in the duodenum, giving stool its brown color. A bile duct obstruction is what causes the pale colored stools. Other symptoms associated with cholelithiasis are upper right quadrant tenderness, Fever from inflammation or infection. I knew to check that. Jaundice from elevated serum bilirubin levels. And nausea or upper right quadrant pain after a fatty meal. Pain at McBurney's point lies between the umbilicus and right iliac crest and is associated with appendicitis. A bleeding ulcer produces black tarry stools. Respiratory distress is not a symptom of cholelithiasis. Learn something new, guys. McBurney's point is where you feel your appendix pain. It's between the umbilical, umbilicus and right iliac crest right there. Okay, number five. A client who has been scheduled to have a... Oh, my goodness, guys. Cholidocolithotomy. Something's removed. Expresses anxiety about having surgery, which... In nursing intervention would be the most appropriate to achieve the outcome of anxiety reduction. So what's going to reduce their anxiety? Providing the client with information about what to expect postoperatively. That would reduce my anxiety. Telling the client it is normal to be afraid. Mm, wouldn't really reduce my anxiety. Reassuring the client by telling her the surgery is a common procedure. That's not going to reassure me. Stressing the importance of the following the physician's instructions after surgery. It's important, but it's not going to reduce anxiety. Definitely number one. Telling people what to expect. Knowledge decreases anxiety. And that is, yes, providing information. Fear of the unknown increases anxiety. Telling the client not to be afraid that the procedure is common or following the physician's orders. That won't necessarily decrease anxiety. We're doing okay, guys. Right. Six, a client has an open cholecystectomy with a bile duct exploration. Okay, that means not laparoscopic. Following surgery, the client has a T-tube hmm, to evaluate the effectiveness of the T-tube. I don't know what a T-tube is. Let's see if we can figure it out. The nurse should irrigate it with 20 mils of normal saline every four hours. Unclamp the T-tube and empty the contents every day. Assess the color and amount of drainage every shift. Monitor the multiple incision sites for bile drainage. I'm going to say that they're going to assess the color and amount of drainage every shift. And that this T-tube probably lets bile escape directly out of your body. Like out of this tube so they can see it better. 
So let's see. T-tube is inserted into the common bile duct to maintain patency until edema from the duct exploration subsides. The bile color should be gold to dark green, and the amount of drainage should be closely monitored to ensure patency. Irrigating the tube is not routinely done unless ordered using a smaller volume of fluid. Yeah, I thought 20 mils was a lot to be pushing into someone's bile duct. Uh, T-tube is not clamped in the early post-op period to allow for continuous drainage and open cholecystectomy has one right subcostal incision where it's laparoscopic has multiple small incisions so we got that one right Woohoo! we're doing good guys we're doing good at 8 a.m the nurse reviews the amount of t-tube drainage for a client who underwent an open cholecystectomy yesterday after reviewing the output record see chart the nurse should okay here's the record 50 mils 60 mils 60 mils 70 mils 70 mils 10 mils what should the nurse do obviously there was a big drop so i'm gonna say evaluate the tube for patency like make sure it's not clamped because the 8 a.m is so much less than the others so let's see the t-tube should drain approximately 300 to 500 mils in the first 24 hours and Okay, in the first 24 hours, but we're at the second day. And after three to four days, the amount will decrease to less than 200 mils in 24 hours. With the sudden decrease in drainage at 8 a.m., the nurse should immediately assess the tube for obstruction of flow that can be caused by kinks in the tube or the client laying on the tube. Drainage color must also be assessed for signs of bleeding. The tube should not be irrigated or clamped without an order. We got it right! Woohoo! All right, number eight. The nurse measures the amount of bile drainage from a T-tube and records it by which one of the following methods? Okay, how do you chart bile duct stuff? Adding it to the client's urine output. No, no way. Charting it separately on the output record. That makes sense because you keep track of intakes, intake, and outputs. Um, adding it to the amount of wound drainage. Subtracting it from the total intake for each day. You're not going to subtract it from the total intake. I mean, maybe wound drainage, but I feel like, no, I feel like it should be two. It's separate. It's not a wound drainage. It's expected to drain. So we're going to go with two. Record it separately on the output record. Yeah. Adding the T-tube drainage to urine output or wound drainage makes it difficult to accurately determine the amount of bile, urine, or drainage. The client's total intake would be incorrect if the drainage is subtracted from it. We got it right. Woohoo. Okay, nine. After a cholesis me. I'm not pronouncing this right, am I, guys? The client is to follow a low-fat diet. Which of the following foods would be most appropriate to include in a low-fat diet? Which one's the lowest fat? Bet we can do this, but we all get this one right. Number one, cheese omelet. Cheese is fattening. Two, peanut butter. Peanut butter is fattening. Three, ham salad sandwich. Ham salad has mayo in it. Four, roast beef. I'm going to go with the roast beef. I hadn't read them before I said we'd all get them right. It was a little harder than I thought, but I think it's roast beef. Number nine, lean meat such as beef, lamb, veal, and well-trimmed lean ham and pork are low in fat. Rice, pasta, vegetables low in fat when not served with butter, cream, or sauces. Fruits are low in fat. The amount of fat and allowed in a client's diet after a coli cystectomy will depend on the client's ability to tolerate fat typically the client does not require a special diet but is encouraged to avoid excessive fat intake a cheese omelet and peanut butter have high fat content ham salad is high in fat from the fat and the salad dressing we got it i bet you got it too all right number 10 a client with cholecystitis continues to have severe upper right quadrant pain the nurse obtains the following vital sense temperature 38.4 celsius is that a fever? I think that's fever. Pulse 114. That's kind of high. Respirations 22. That's really high. Blood pressure 142 over 90. That's kind of high. Using the SBAR situation background assessment recommendations technique for communication, the nurse recommends to the primary care provider for the client to receive 
Ooh, I'm going to recommend a drug. What drug should we give them? Hydromorphone, which is also called Dilaudid. Diltiazam, which is also called Cardizam. Mepiridine, which is also called Demerol. Or Promethazine, which is also called Finagrin. Uh, I'm going to go with that. Demerol, because we said earlier that was a better thing and wouldn't like irritate uh, the gallbladder. It might help with spasms, maybe. Let's see if we're right. Let's see if that's that Demerol. I am. Dilaudid. Womp, womp, womp. Got it wrong. Let's find out why Dilaudid, guys. Dilaudid should be considered for severe pain management. Okay, and they're in severe pain. It should be administered intravenously. Guys, I didn't even talk about that, but Dilaudid was IV. The second choice was oral. The third choice was intramuscular. And the fourth choice, it didn't say how. So maybe it was oral med then. But yeah, intravenously for rapid action. Intramuscular injections are painful and slower acting since mepiridine's mer toxic metabolite can cause seizures. It is no longer treatment choice for pain. Dil Diltiazam, a calcium channel blocker, is not indicated. Elevation of heart rate and blood pressure are likely due to pain and fever. Finagrin is to treat nausea. Dilaudid, severe pain afterwards. Dilaudid via IV because it's quicker. All right, we've done 10. Let's keep going, though. 11, the nurse prepares to administer finagrin, which is also called promethazine. That's for nausea. 35 milligrams IM as ordered PRN for a client with cholecystitis complaining of nausea. The ampule label reads that the medication is available in 25 milligrams per milliliter. How many milliliters should the nurse administer? Guys, this is basic math. If there's 25 milligrams in a milliliter and we want 35 milligrams, uh, it doesn't tell us what to round to, but one mil is going to be 25, and then 20.2 is going to be another five, so or six. It's going to be 1.6 mils, I believe. That's doing mental math. I would use a calculator for real if this was for a test, but I'm in a hurry. Oh, yeah, I got it wrong, guys. Uh Oh, I was adding 15, yeah. Yeah, use your calculator. So you want desired over have is how you do it, guys. You have 25 milligrams is what you desire over, I mean, 35 milligrams is what you desire over what you have, which is uh, 25 milligrams in a milliliter. You're going to come out with 1.4. I knew that every 5 milligrams was 0.2. I just was adding 15. Yeah, mental math. Don't do that, guys. Double check your math. Because those are easy ones to get right. Those are easy ones to get right. So double check it. It's easy to make a little mistake, but you can double check it and know if your math is right or not. I got time for one more, and then I got to go to my online class. The client undergoes a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. That means lots of laparoscopic, lots of incisions. Which of the following dietary instructions should the nurse give the client immediately after surgery? You cannot eat or drink anything for 24 hours. You may resume your normal diet the day after your surgery. Drink liquids today and eat lightly for a few days. You can progress from a liquid to a bland diet as tolerated. I think it's a lot easier when it's laparoscopic. I'm going to guess with a... Um... I don't know. None of these are super serious. Let's say drink liquids today and eat lightly for a few days, but I don't know. Let's see. Number 12. Immediately after surgery, the plant will drink liquids. Light diet can be resumed the day after surgery. That is right. All right. Time for class. Thanks, guys.